Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is a Rona Katana Italian arming sword. And before I get into the review, a couple quick disclaimers. First, this is a review sample from Rona Katana. That means that I didn't pay any money for it. And if you think that makes me biased, then you know right away. Also, it's a review sample sent for destruction testing. Testing is a strong word that implies scientific methodology, which I'm not going to use. I'm going to bash it into things during this review. I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. I'm going to talk about the build quality, but there's no scientific methodology. It's more like abusive usage, and we'll see if it uh, how long it lasts. And hopefully that'll help you understand if it's worth your hard-earned money or not. Uh, also, this is a scratch and dent iteration from Ronin Katana, so hopefully the one you would get if you were to buy one new would be prettier than this one. Uh, I didn't really see a whole lot of problems with it. There were a couple small things, and I'll try to note them in the review, but it should be pretty representative. Just note it's a scratch and dent, so if you see some stuff, maybe, maybe it has to do with that. Uh, lastly, I am not a student of historic European martial arts, nor am I an expert or any authority on swords, so keep in mind that this review is my thoughts, my musings. I do study swordsmanship, I do collect swords, I am an enthusiast, but I'm not an expert, and you should keep that in mind as you, as you hear my rambles, which I'm going to continue on with right now. Before we can answer the question, is it worth your money or not, I suppose you should know how much it is, and right now, as of the recording of this video, it is $275. You might find it for more or less, depending on when you watch this video or how much they are at the time, but at the moment, you can get them for $275. Bucks. And for $275, it's worth noting what's advertised, and that is honestly very little. If you go to the website, it just basically says, here's an arming sword, it's this dimension, it's made of 1075 steel, which is not something I really harp on very much because I have no way of validating it or not, but it just says it's a carbon steel sword and it's this dimension and it's from Ronan Katana. It's not advertised as a backyard beater or something that's meant to chop through logs or survive anything, nor is it advertised as some dynamically superior thing used in some sort of training. It's, it's kind of, here's the photo, here's the sword, and hopefully this video will help articulate what, what, might it, what it might fit into, but as I noted earlier, I'm not a student of historic European martial arts, or really much of a student of history. So if you know what category this might fit into, or if you think it would work in your training, it'd be helpful to hear that in the commentary down below. I'll include specifics and weapon dynamics links and all of that in the description down below as well. Now I'm going to talk about the build quality of the sword. Before I do a couple quick notes, this sword has not been used, nor have I used it much. So as I'm talking about it, this is from some basic dry handling, some quick motions, but that's all I've done at this point in the review. I haven't cut anything. And I wanted to show the overall quality of the sword before I diminish the quality, before I break it or make it less than. I, I thought I would show it to you as it is. So at this point in the review, as this at this point in recording, I have not used the sword, and my impressions might change, and I'll I'll try to explain them if they do. Anyway, let's jump right into it. So right here on the pommel, what you're able to see is that there isn't any kind of peen. There's a peen here, but it's really, really tough to make out. You can kind of see some small pockets around it, and that's about the only way you can see it. Now, the tang is typically a different carbon steel than the actual fittings on the sword, so over time you might be able to see the, the peen area because it turns into a slightly more rusty circle quickly than the rest of the fittings do. The pommel, though, I really like the shape. Now, I don't know exactly what shape this is. There's a name for it, and it's escaping me. I don't think it's a fishtail pommel, but it's, it's kind of the same thing. Basically, it really lets me get an extra hand on here, and I'll talk about the length and all that when I talk about the grip, but I like the overall kind of practical functionality of this pommel in terms of how it works and just lets you get an extra hand on there. I really like that. Also, uh, I don't like that the edges aren't as clean as they could be. It could be a little nicer, but it's, it's, not, it's not bad, again, given the price point. And none of the ledges are sharp. I can, I can be pretty aggressive with my hand on here and nothing bites in. I don't, I don't have little blood spots on me if I try to really grip the sword harder, move my hand around it. These points can be somewhat uncomfortable, but that's just the general design of the pommel. Overall, though, I think the lines could be crisper, but I like that they're not sharp, and I like that this design is available in a less expensive sword. If I move on to where the transition meets over here on the grip. I'm not in too enthusiastic about this spot. It doesn't, I mean, there's not one thing I can say is, is bad. Functionally, the, the ledges don't let me kind of get my finger on them. There's a slight bulge on one side where the stitching is. But realistically, I mean, it, it does all the functions. It just it doesn't look as clean and crisp as it could be. Again, price point, I'm not gonna complain too much. Overall, I like, I like the pommel quite a bit, but uh, it could be a little bit more refined uh, to my eyes anyway. In terms of the grip, the first thing I want to point out is that the grip is big. So you'll notice that I can basically get two hands, not comfortably mind you, but I can get two hands on an arming sword. And very often the wheel pommel here would 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 be in this area and it would kind of cement my hand between the cross guard and the wheel pommel and I have giant, giant sausage hands, so maybe that's that's why. Uh, but it gives me a sense of my hand is really secure in the in the in the grip and, and this is not the case here. Uh, if I if I 
choke up I can get two hands on, which I suppose can be a boon if you want to use the sword two-handed, but arming swords, I, as I understand it, are one-handed swords. And this is a pretty big grip for a one-handed sword. It does add, I would imagine, to the, the usability. I can get two hands on it reasonably comfortably, um, but at the same time, I don't know that I should be able to get two hands on it. Nevertheless, uh, the grip is larger. I have giant sausage hands. I don't necessarily mind it, but it does make me question if this is actually an arming sword. Um, but I guess I, <laughs> I don't know the classification. It's intended for one-handed use, and the extra grip does give you a little bit more uh, ability to kind of choose how you want to do that. If you want to hold the sword lower or higher, I suppose, I suppose you could do that, and it gives you two-handed options. In terms of the overall construction of the grip, well, we have leather over some larger cord, which I believe is then wrapped over a wood core, which is filled with epoxy and kind of stuck over the tang so that it fills up any spaces. I'll break this apart eventually and show you how the construction works out. But uh, overall, I have to say I like the, the feeling of the grip, or rather I like the feeling of these cords. And in this one, they don't move around. In some iterations, I want to say I've been able to push the cords around when they've been made this way, but I, I don't in this case. They feel quite tight. I do feel the stitching, and it's not a, a comfortable feeling. I suppose it lets me know which edge is which, um, but I don't particularly like this the stitching on the side here. Now initially in some other Ronin swords I thought that this would be problematic and I thought that this would break, but the stitching is held up for the usage that I've used it for and, and hasn't come undone shy of me intentionally doing it. Uh, that said, um, I I just don't I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like the stitching on here. I would I would rather it was lacquered over and I and I wasn't able to feel the, the stitching. Personal preference, though, on this one. Functionally, it, it does the job, and maybe you like to be able to feel the stitching. I would say it doesn't bite into my hand as I've been moving it around. It's not uncomfortable, at least not in the usage that I've had so far. Uh, it's also worth noting that it becomes more spherical. Here, it's an elliptical grip, and that means that I am able to effectively figure out where the edge is if I close my eyes. It's, it's easy to index and figure out where the edge is. Uh, it's also relatively easy to move your second hand around here because it becomes more cylindrical. It's still elliptical, but not not as much so. The transition here I, isn't actually bad uh, where it meets the cross, so it doesn't overlap. There's no kind of schmutz or yucky stuff that's stuck up on anywhere. None of the lacquer or, or whatever they're using to color the leather here has transitioned onto the cross guard, and so there's no stains or anything like that. I, I have to say I, I like that. Um, this transition is, is pretty pretty well done. That brings us to the cross guard. So the cross guard itself, minus the fingerprints that are on it, is actually pretty well done. And this is kind of the inverse in terms of problems. The cross guard has nice, clean, crisp lines. The central ridge is pretty crisp. Uh, these lines are, are prominent and clean. I, I think the execution on this cross guard is, is quite good, but the lines are a little too sharp. Now, I'm not cutting myself when I'm using it, but these ledges are just a little bit sharp. So I'm, I'm, I know I'm giving a little bit of Goldilocks syndrome here on the pommel. They're saying, well, it's not very sharp and I like that because I can move my hand over it, but it doesn't look as crisp. And over here I'm saying it looks really crisp, but it's too sharp. Somewhere in between these two, I think would be the perfect spot because this looks clean, clean and crisp. I like the, 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 how nice the lines are, but it, it's also a little harsh on my hands. And I think uh, the a middle ground between the cross guard and the pommel would would really aesthetically uh, shine a little bit more while simultaneously managing usability. Anyway, I don't know if this cross guard really works with this pommel or historically if they would have gone together, but again, it's not sold as a historical reference. It's a medieval looking sword and, and to that end, I think it looks medieval, uh, but uh, I don't know if these two would have historically gone together or not. Uh, where the pommel is, it's worth noting how it butts up into the, or not the pommel, where the cross guard is, how it butts up into the scabbard. I like that the scabbard, you know, granted it, it kind of bunches up the leather a little bit, but I like that this kind of section here rests where the scabbard is. The other thing I talk about is the gap in the cross guard, and overall I would say that this is reasonable. It, it, along the blade edge side, it, it's certainly a little little wider, it could be a little tighter in there in those spots, but overall, I would say again, for a $275 sword, this does not seem like a bad execution. It could be nicer, but it could also be a lot worse, especially given the price point. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the scabbard. So first off, I want to say it rattled more when I got it out of the box. Um, maybe it's the humidity or something like that, but it, it's not rattling right now. It also retains the sword without being really difficult to draw. So it'll come out, but a good shake will we'll kind of get it out, but I can turn it upside down without it without it falling out. So in terms of retention functionality, the scabbard is, is actually exactly what I'd like to see. Not a ton of rattle, I'd like to see none, um, but also easy to draw, but doesn't fall out if I bend over to pick something up, which has happened to me. I remember I've, I've tried to wear some of these and I've been like, ooh, a piece of candy, and I bend over and I've, I've caught the sword and it's, uh, it's 
uh, dangerous and not not good. So I like that it retains it. Some people have different opinions on if the sword should come out more or less. Uh, to me, I like some level of retention, but I don't want to really have to fight with it uh, to, to draw it. Anyway, other notes about the sword. Earlier, I had, when I drew it, when I got it out of the package, the leather was bunched up down here, and I was able to just basically straighten it out by pulling on it. But it's worth noting that I can really uh, just twist this leather around. It, it moves around pretty easily on me. And so I don't know if that's good or bad, but most of the scabbards that I've had have been uh, really tight and glued on. This one is not, but, you know, again, price point. At $275, you get a blade, a sword, and a scabbard, and a belt system. So how good they're going to be is, is questionable. It's a wood cord scabbard that doesn't rattle a lot, and it retains. Functionally, it does the job, but uh, the leather moving around is, is not necessarily great. That said, uh, it moves around and it, it straightens out pretty quick as well. So it was bunched up down here, which I suspect may have been why this was a scratch and dent piece. I just gave it a tug and, and it straightened out and now it looks uh, sufficient to me. I also have to say I like this uh, I like this shape area here. One, because it doesn't have any ledges. If I push my fingers on here, there's nothing that bites into them. Like there is a ledge, but it's not it's not so much so that if I were walking around with this, it wouldn't snag on things and I wouldn't have, you know, the, the old cliche bull in a china shop syndrome. Overall, I like the execution of this, uh, of this shape here. Uh, the mouth of the scabbard also does not have any metal component to it, and it's covered in leather. It looks nice right now, but I don't know how well this is going to hold up with repeated usage, though I don't know that European martial artists are doing the same kind of iaido where they're drawing and resheathing, you know, hundreds or thousands of times in a, in a day or in a practice session. Uh, that said, Certainly there is some concern that it won't hold up, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to give it a fair test over time, but at the moment I like that it's covered in leather and it looks, it looks reasonably nice. Uh, the belt system looks simple. The leather on here I wouldn't say is of the, the finest quality, but uh, it looks like it's sufficient to, to hold the sword certainly, and I'll make my best attempt at using a belt system a little bit later. Anyway, scabbard for the money, it's certainly sufficient. Now I'm going to talk about the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part, and there's a couple things to cover. One, I don't know what typology this would be or if it is a typology. If you happen to know, throw it in the commentary down below. Uh, it's got a fuller that runs about uh, two-thirds of the way up then, turns into a diamond cross section toward towards the tip here. Um, it's a relatively stiff blade, and if I talk about the main thing I don't like about it, it's really that it has a very minimal distal taper. It's a quarter inch, and then it, it goes down only slightly. I'll include those specifications down below, but it's very minimal distal taper. Obviously, it does taper the other way, but it doesn't have this kind of distal taper in the blade, which doesn't lend itself to being a very nimble sword. Uh, the dynamics will likely show that, and I'll talk about moving it around in just a moment. Suffice to say, though, that's one thing that I don't really like about this particular sword. That said, um, there are other things that I would say I'm not a fan of, and if I go over the sword, uh, let's see if I can get my camera to participate. So if I show you in the in the light here, um, there are some scuffs and scratches that have come from shipping, and that's not something I like, and also some streaking that is a result of the wax that's kind of left on the blade, and it's tough to clean off. Every time I put the blade in the scabbard and take it out, it leaves some kind of streaks on there that I have to clean off, and it's I understand why they're there to protect the sword, but at the same time it makes it kind of messy and unfun to, to draw and have to clean off each time. Uh, that said, uh, the wax will likely abate eventually, or I could try and clean the scabbard out. These smudges on here, though, or scuffs from shipping, are not things that will come out. They're minor, they're small, and I would say any $275 sword is probably going to have something like this, uh, but uh, this kind of slightly above satin polish shows those. If it were a really satiny kind of sandy uh, polish or, or grit of sandpaper that were used, they won't pop out so much, but given that it has a slightly shinier appearance, those those scuffs tend to pop out. A last bit I'm not terribly fond of is that Ronin Katana can make a sharper sword. This is not as sharp as I would like it. Uh, later, I'm going to sharpen one side of the sword. I'm going to probably sharpen the side with the stitching so I can know which side I, I have sharpened so I can test a factory edge and a slightly more refined edge. Now note, I suck at sharpening, but I'm going to try and give it just a little keener edge in the hopes that it'll, it'll be a better cutter and we'll, we'll examine that. But at the moment, it hasn't been sharpened. So that's the list of things that I don't like about the blade, but there are a lot of things that I do like about the blade. First off, uh, the overall shape, I, I have to say, I'm relatively pleased with, and I like the execution on lines here. There are very clean lines. The surfaces of the, the steel are actually pretty flat, all things considered. Now, this is again a $275 sword, and most of the $275 swords that I've seen uh, have what looks like, you know, rocks thrown into a still pond in terms of their surfaces. They're ripply all over the place. 
this is, is relatively clean. Also, the center ridge after the fuller section is straight on both sides. The sword doesn't bend or wobble. The edge is, is consistent. There's uh, no secondary bevel from the fuller. It just kind of goes straight down all the way to the edge. It looks like you can make out a slight secondary bevel here, but it doesn't seem like that. It just seems like it's not terribly sharp there. Uh, the fuller as well terminates in the same spot. So right here it has a nice clean termination and on the other side as well. When I say terminates in the same spot and cleanly, I like this crisp termination rather than gently fading off into nothing. And on some swords, they'll fade off to the left on one side and the right on the other or the left on the other and it just doesn't look as even as it could be. And this, the termination is quite good. I, I like the execution. I like that the blade has a slightly above average polish. I like the tip is uh, reinforced and, and it's very very pointy as a tip would be but this this section here is, is clean and I think well done overall uh, the the build quality on this looks looks quite nice minus the scuffs minus the streaking that you might see um, I think they did a, a very good job in terms of the overall build quality I think it's a very handsome blade Alright, so that's it for kind of the glamour shot section of the sword. I haven't swung the sword around enough yet, so I'm going to go do that now. Time warp. Right over there, sword friends. So I have put a edge on one side, as I noted earlier, and basically you have factory edge here. It cuts okay, and then you have my sharpened edge. I am not very good at polishing or sharpening, and so if you are able to do it, well, basically if you have any competency in sharpening, you will be able to achieve equal or greater results uh, to this. I used a sanding belt with strop first. <laughs> it wasn't having luck move to a thousand grit belt and then uh, move right back to the strop and that's what uh, that's what I have here. So you were able to see some of the results here. It does not look too bad all things considered. Uh, we'll see how it fares. Also before I forget the scabbard system or rather the belt system that holds a scabbard is effectively useless. By that I mean it does make a belt. I would say it's not of the greatest quality but more that it holds it almost horizontally at least the way that I was able to figure out and I could be doing it wrong. Maybe it's it, require some kajiggering that I didn't quite understand, but it seemed to be a pretty simple mechanism and it held it basically horizontally. So if I, well, the sword could fall out, it kept it in kind of a dangerous position. I'd like to have it more pointed upward if, uh, if at all possible, and it didn't really seem to do that. Though I imagine with a little bit of tinkering, one could probably make it work out, just I didn't possess the means or aptitude to do so, or perhaps the desire. Anyway, not, not my favorite.
cutting was basically what you would expect to do with a sword of this type. I cut pool noodles, water bottles, and used Japanese tatami mats. None of those would be things that I would consider destructive, and the sword should be able to do those things and survive. Now, obviously, I did do thousands of repetitions with either one, but I put it through general paces, and it's still straight and good and did not have any edge damage or anything, and that's exactly what you would hope it would do. It would not have any damage from doing those types of activities. I don't honestly even spot any kind of blemishes, like cutting scratches or the like, uh, from, from those activities, which is something I would, I would kind of expect. So um, whatever type of abrasion resistance this metal uh, has seem, seems to be working well. Uh, some notes from, from cutting, I suppose. One, just in general, this was not comfortable with two hands. I thought it might be comfortable with two hands, but this pommel shape, uh, while it makes my fingers rest pretty well and comfortably on it, well, I wouldn't say comfortable, but while I feel like I can get a good grip here in swinging it, uh, this little nub in here rubs in the palm of my hand and becomes very, very uncomfortable. So with gloves or something like that that might take away some of the the pain, uh, it might be more usable. In one hand, this is feels connected more than I thought it did, but I got kind of tired swinging it around. It was uh, kind of difficult to control and very easy to overswing, and a little tricky with one hand to generate kind of tip speed, which I don't know if I did particularly well yet. I haven't watched the video. Didn't feel like it's not a performance I'm proud of, but I would say uh, it felt cumbersome to move around. When I cut the pool noodle, I was really surprised that it didn't cut better. This edge feels very, very sharp on one side, and I really did expect it to move through the pool noodle with some degree of ease, and the fact that it didn't was interesting. I kind of then took a pool noodle and ground it against the edge, and it really bound in, and I think the wide shape here, this very thick uh, cutting plane here, just didn't lend itself to moving through that pool noodle would just kind of grab on. It's also very humid outside, so it's possible that the the humidity or just general stickiness on the blade uh, aided that. I, I guess I, all of that is speculative on my part. It just did not cut the pool noodle particularly well at all. Uh, when I cut milk jugs, well, it cut those very well. Don't ask why I drink so much cream. I do. Uh, but when I cut into the kind of cream containers, those kind of milk cartons, uh, the, the sharpened edge obviously did much better. The factory edge just kind of tore through it, I would say. If I swung hard, it would cut through, but it really didn't cut particularly well. The sharpened edge, though, really actually moved well. It left the container on the stand, which is, which is good and not generally <laughs> how my cutting works. I'm not very good at those angles, and the fact that it stayed there is kind of a testament to the fact that it moved through. My angles seem to be pretty good in that case, but generally it's not anyway. So suffice to say, the, the cutting of the milk carton seemed to go pretty well. And on the used Japanese tatami, I did one cut with a factory edge, and it cut-ish um, actually reasonably well for a non -particular, not particularly sharp side of the blade. When I flipped it around, though, I, admittedly in that first cut, I did put more... I tried to do as even as I could, and that's not really true. I, I did a piss-poor job of doing an even comparison between them. And one, I was trying to let the sword do the work, and it cut most of the way through. And the second one, I really did put more more stank on it, you might say, put more force in, and obviously it cut through. What I will say though is in some of the upward directional cuts, uh, it actually cut through. It cut reasonably small pieces of tatami, it, it cut reasonably well. I'm using the kind of re reprofiled edge that I put on there, and actually as, as a tatami cutter it actually moved well. I would say the biggest pain was just, it, it's very hard to move. <laughs> it's hard to generate that tip speed, and I totally feel it in my shoulder, but it feels good overall. I mean, it's it's cumbersome, but it did it did really well in the cut. So if it is a cut-centric sword, obviously I, I'm not really testing the thrust here on tatami. It certainly thrust through tatami and milk jugs, no surprise there. But in terms of cutting, it, it moved through the targets actually surprisingly well. I, w I was kind of nervous when I cut the pool noodle. I didn't think that it would really go as well as it did when I got to the tatami, but it actually cut the tatami better better than I thought it would. So anyway, those are general thoughts from cutting. At this point, Sword seems to do what it's supposed to do in terms of cutting general targets. Whether or not you're impressed is, I suppose, up to you. But now I'm going to move on with the abusive stuff.
this participates. small nicks right in this area of my thumb but this is full of staples so it looks like I've managed to whack one or two I think I whacked the can somewhere. I'm not seeing where. Got a couple minor edge to the chips for the looks of it right around the area that I've sharpened, but they're not not terribly deep. anything significant. Slid off the can. Caused it to bend pretty significantly. It's pretty thick steel though. It's caused quite a bit of edge to It's hard to tell where I'm actually hitting it, but I believe it's right where my finger is, up here. I've got some more damage to the edge in a wider space. But overall, pretty impressive. Not sure exactly what angle I'm achieving there, but hopefully it's sufficient to say that it is returning. Okay.
a dinger. To be expected. Morning. All of this is really considered abusive. The softer, kind of damp log, the dead tree, not so much. Debatable, it would be a harder target. Um, the wood is pretty wet. <laughs> I just pulled it out of the, the pond back there, so it's sitting, but it's old. Um, still, technically I would say that that is, that is on the abusive side. It cut in pretty well, no damage from what I could see. Uh, thrusting the tip in the hardwood is certainly abusive there. So again, you should be able to thrust the twisting mill. That's where I would start to call it abusive. Uh, slicing into hard wood like this chair with staples in it, that's certainly abusive. And really it survived up until that point. Initially bending it as well, it seemed to do it pretty well. As soon as I stuck it in the ground and twisted or bent it further, that's when I noticed some degree of set. But certainly taking it to a large stainless steel sword is definitely abusive. Um, slapping it, hitting it, doing the things I'm doing at this point are all pretty well in the abusive territory. So I'm expecting this to take damage. It's braced against the metal drum um, and it's a much thicker piece of seal. So I, I am expecting this to be damaged at this point. Uh, it's well into abusive. As many strikes as it takes, the, the better, I suppose. But at this point, I'm, I'm intending to make the sword fail. I'm going to degrade it, I'm going to bash it against this sword, and then I'm going to flip it around on the reverse side and hit it, and hopefully it'll come apart at that point. That's more or less what I'm expecting. Show the camera here. So it's pretty gnarled up at this point. But you can see kind of each one of the strikes that I've made. But I'm also noticing, and forgive the windy audio today, at this point it has developed some rattle in the cross guard. Not a lot, but enough. Pommel is tight, the grip still feels tight. No other damage other than <laughs> the obvious. The grain looks bigger than some I've seen, but you metallurgists out there might know more. Noticing some deformation here. 
So the peen has started to kind of suck in. I'm going to give the peen a couple of whacks. Alright, so I'm not sure exactly when my camera stopped, but you can see the pommel is almost straightened out slightly. If I hit with the other sword and cut into this, these fibers feel very tense and they are not... I don't know if they're just wound around. You can see the wood core. It's obviously cracked. No great surprise there. It's worth worth pointing out that the stitching didn't come undone. You can kind of make out the resin in here that's used to fill around the tang, but here is the size of the tang. So the peen is moved around slightly. Let's see if we can do this. All right, so the peen has moved around ever so slightly. You can also make out kind of how, how hard I'm hitting it. Some of these gashes. Here is our tang appears of a reasonable size. Alright, so you can almost see how the tang is thinner right near where the cross is, a little beneath it. So where the cross is, it thickens out, kind of right where your hand is, usually where the node is on the sword, um, or on the, on the grip, the vibration node somewhere in here, it's usually where they end up, it kind of thins out, and then it gets thicker 
how you see it kind of tapers the other way here. It's pretty thick towards the, the pommel area. Green structure on the broken piece. Green structure on the sword. I don't see any uh, any kind of black marks. Uh, this is obviously probably from being pounded into the can, um, but I don't see any places where it was flawed critically. And in fact, it took more strikes to break, I suppose, than I than I would have expected. One or two is giving it a little it's about a break, but it did not. Anyway, for you metallurgy folks out there, here you go. On the cross guard here, you can make out some kind of what looks like blistering in the metal almost. It's deformed. Good news is it did not crack and fly off into the pond. It, it deformed. All right, sword friends. While the experience is fresh in my mind, while I'm still sweaty from the encounter, I'm going to give you my final thoughts and tell you whether I think it's worth it or not. Uh, I think the sword really hits it out of the park in terms of durability. Uh, there's a couple things that I would say I want to recap here. One, I identified very early that the sword dynamically was not my favorite, and that is still true, but to a lesser extent. I'm not tired from moving it around. My hand didn't hurt from hitting anything with it. I found it controllable. I swung it wild a couple times, but it, it maintained some level of control. So while it's cumbersome to move around, it's not impossible or bad, especially given the price point and the, the durability that it affords you. Uh, other things, uh, I obviously did some abusive testing. I think it held up really well to all the up to metal cutting, if you will. Um, it didn't take any edge damage, even on the refined edge that I put on it, which you would think would take or chip or, or dull quicker. Uh, the steel held up really well to cutting into some, some boards and things like that, and it wasn't until it hit staples that it deformed, and I would say that those minor things, when I initially started doing some metal cutting and hit the staples or the, the harder wood, uh, all of that could have been fixed pretty easily uh, with, with some additional sharpening. I could have probably honed that edge up a little bit and it wouldn't have been that bad, especially for cutting metal. So it, it held up really well. It didn't bend very easy either. The first couple bends, it didn't take any kind of bend, permanent bend or set. Uh, it wasn't until I stuck it in the ground and bent it at what I think is about 90 degrees that it, that it really kind of stayed, and even that was pretty slight. Uh, the quillings, I want to say, held up really well, especially in comparison. I don't test these very often, so thanks to the people that have told me to test them, because obviously it's an important thing. They deform maybe easier than they should. They get cut into perhaps easier than they should, but they deform, and that makes me think that my hand would be protected rather than uh, rather than have the, the you know the quillian fly off into nowhere. Uh, so they deformed rather than broke, which was good. The pommel bent slightly, but and I'm able to see where the peen section is, but it never came off. And there are some concerning things here, like it's thinner in this section than it is here, but you saw what I did to this hilt assembly, and it, it didn't break. So however it's made, it's sufficient to, to hold up to some pretty abusive uh, pretty abusive testing. Uh, the sword, anyway, held up really well to cutting, held up really well to, to uh, <laughs> the abuse that I put it through lasted longer than I expected to. Some surprises, I would say, pool noodles. I really expected the edge to cut into a pool noodle better than it did, but it cut to Tommy better than I expected after after having cut that pool noodle. Also, when I was breaking this sword, I told you I'm, gonna, I'm expecting it to break, and it took more hits uh, to break the sword than I expected. It took more force than, than others have in the past. So it's a pretty, pretty beefy sword, minimal distal taper, and maybe that's what, what lent it to lasting longer than, than perhaps others have. Now that said, if I could offer Ronan Katana any suggestions on this one, I think the, the hilt could be a little smaller, maybe an inch and a half smaller. Personal preference here, I'm not a historian, I don't know if arming swords are all like that, but this seems a little bit uh, large, and I think dynamically and overall it would just be better if the if the grip were a little bit smaller. My personal preference, maybe you like this. If you do throw it in the comments down below, it would be interesting to see how many people like this size versus would like a, a smaller handle for an arming sword. Also, if there, I could offer one suggestion, it would be to add in distal taper. I would be happy to take some sacrifice in durability to have dynamically this sword kind of come come alive in my hand. I think it's almost there. Um, even if this stayed the same, if the if the distal taper thinned out towards the tip of the blade, I think it would just, it would, it would really level out in my hand and feel quite a bit more nimble, quite a bit more lively, and, and really be a fun thing to swing around. I understand that might come at the cost of durability, that it might take less strikes to break, but I bet it would hold up to most of the testing about as, as well as it did here. Uh, the sharpness as well, the edge that it came with 
maybe that's how uh, European style swords come. It'd be nicer if it was a little sharper, though admittedly I didn't have too much issue uh, getting it kind of up to snuff. And admittedly most people that sell European style swords don't come with katana-ish razor type edges, so it's not a surprise there. And I suppose that brings me to uh, do I think it's worth it or not. Honestly, I'm pretty impressed for $275, especially as I compare it to other $275 swords or that ballpark out there. Realistically, the problems this sword has are, are shared in most of the swords in that category and where and I think honestly it does a little better and isn't as, as dramatic. The weight is, is less cumbersome than many other two hundred, three hundred dollar swords. Uh, the quillions and whatnot were more durable. Uh, the edge held up better and it was a very durable sword. So I, I think there, there there are some things th certainly going for it. Uh, granted you lose some dynamics, but overall for two hundred and seventy five dollars I think this gives you a lot for your money, realistically. Hopefully this video proved that. I think it's probably more suited to people that want to have some fun in the backyard, at least as it is. It's very durable. Little little cumbersome to move around, but it seems like it it holds up pretty well to the backyard cutter. I don't know if I'd want to do like sword and buckler. Not that I do that anyway, but I, I think I'd want something maybe a little bit a little bit more nimble to get in and out of quicker. At least those are my thoughts. But if you have experience in historic European martial arts, if you know where this sword might fit in, in terms of some sort of system of martial arts practice, let me know. For me, I'd say backyard shenanigans. Uh, it, it does a great job, especially for the money. For two hundred seventy-five bucks, it's tough for me to to think of a sword at at around that price point that does does it much better. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I hope the video's been interesting. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.